next Pats podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the next Pats podcast. I'm Phil Perry. We have a tremendous episode, in my humble opinion, lined up for you this week. We're bringing in Patriots legend. Rob Ninkovich is coming in to talk with us about the player I thought was the most impressive rookie that we saw on Sunday from the Patriots in week one. Christian Gonzalez had a great game. Marte Mapu all over the field in about 10 snaps. But it was Keon White that I thought was really eye-opening in terms of the number of times he was in the opposition's backfield in a limited workload. In my opinion, it's going to be hard for Bill Belichick to keep this guy off the field. So a great conversation lined up for you there. We're also talking about Mac Jones, pocket movement, toughness, interesting nuggets there, both from Mac Jones himself and teammate David Andrews. We're also going to talk about the challenge that the Patriots offense faces going up against Vic Fangio and this Dolphins defense in week two. Vic Fangio is known as the godfather of the two high shells that we're seeing all across the league right now. Mac Jones tipped his cap to Fangio in that regard on Wednesday afternoon. Patriots going to have to be on the same page, quarterback and pass catchers over and over and over again on Sunday night football or Fangio and his players will make you pay. Let's start first with Mac Jones and that performance in week one, because I feel as though it was a good performance. Was it a great performance? No. That first interception, the pick six targeted for Kendrick Bourne, not a good throw, something he would acknowledge. The throw down the field to Kendrick Bourne, where they might have had a long, explosive touchdown with Darius Slay in coverage. Bourne had multiple steps from my vantage point in the press box, multiple steps on Darius Slay. Again, opportunity for a big play there. You underthrow him a little bit, it almost gets picked off. Not what you're looking for. A near interception on a screen. We understand. Not ideal when it comes to quarterback play. But I thought late in the game, Mac Jones made a few plays that that people are overlooking. And when they talk about the fact that Mac Jones can't get this team over the hump against a good team late in games, where are the winning plays? Where are the winning plays? Tom Brady made winning plays even when he had receivers who were not necessarily viewed as high-end talent. I want to push against that argument. Number one, Tom Brady was Tom Brady. And number two, for Tom Brady to execute those winning plays that he made late in games with people like Kenbrell Tompkins and others, those guys finished the play. They caught the ball. It takes two to tango. And there are two throws in particular that I'll point to when it comes to Mac Jones in week one, where if he just gets a little help, the outcome of the game, in my opinion, is different. You can start with the obvious, which is the fourth down throw to Kayshawn Booty along the sidelines. You don't get that second foot down. In my opinion, he had the opportunity to do that. I know he got shoved in the back a little bit, but that's a play that you need to make as an NFL wide receiver. His receivers coach, Ross Douglas, said as much to us this week when we were able to meet with him as a media core. Number two, third and 12, late in the game. You're just coming off allowing your first sack of the game on second and five, where the Eagles... And if you watch the breakdown this week, Ted Johnson did a great job of explaining how the Eagles confused the Patriots, showing man coverage, actually playing zone and taking away what looked like a nice, easy pitch and catch for for a first down and maybe more to Ezekiel Elliott. You find yourself in third and 12, critical situation. You have to be able to keep this drive going. What does Mac Jones do? In my opinion, he ends up making one of the best throws of his pro career. To this point. And if you follow me on Twitter at Phil A. Perry, you can find that throw there, the all 22 version of it. He takes a massive, massive shot. He knows it's coming. It's coming from his front side. He steps in. He makes the throw anyway, gets absolutely drilled as soon as the ball is out of his hand. And he still somehow fits it into a tight window to Kendrick Bourne. It's not an easy catch, but it's a catch he should have made. Again, something that even Kendrick Bourne would tell you after the fact. And my buddy James Palmer from NFL Media said after a conversation with Bourne late in the game, he could tell that one play was eating him up. He understood how that might have changed the game had he been able to come up with it. He couldn't, but an incredibly accurate throw in a tough situation, third and long, you're taking a shot and you put it where it needs to be. You can't catch it for him. 
That to me is a winning play. It just doesn't go down as a winning play and a loss, but it's not because of anything that Mac Jones did. Plenty of mistakes in this game for Mac Jones. Don't get me wrong. And if you look at the report card, NBCSportsBoston.com, I give him a B minus. Good game, not a great game. But that play late in the game, if that ends up being caught, it gives you an opportunity to move down the field, maybe score, maybe take the lead. The entire conversation is different. That's why, in my opinion, you have to come away from that game as a Patriots fan, optimistic about the things you saw from Mac Jones. Did you love what you saw in terms of arm strength? Probably not. But you knew going into the season, you knew when he was drafted that he wasn't going to be Josh Allen, he wasn't going to be Patrick Holmes. Can he think his way through the game? Can he make the right decisions? Can he put it on his receivers in a critical moment with accuracy and anticipation? Yes, yes, and yes. And is he tough? I think that one play is a good illustration of how tough he is. But take a look at some of these other numbers when it comes to all the pressure he faced in that game. And he dropped back 58 times, so there were a lot of opportunities for pressure. But he was pressured on almost a third of his snaps, according to Pro Football Focus. And yes, the ball was out very quickly. He was seventh fastest in the NFL when it came to release time, 2.9 seconds, under three seconds, very quick. A lot of that is because of screens. He had 13 passes that were attempted behind the line of scrimmage. And on those throws, the ball was out in about one second, 1.35 seconds on those 13 throws. But he also showed toughness. There was that throw that I just mentioned on third and 12. There was another with bodies at his feet, understanding that he was under duress, 30 seconds left in the first half. All kinds of landmines in the pocket. And he makes... A nice throw to Juju Smith-Schuster along the sideline. They pick up seven yards. Next play, 19-yard touchdown to Kendrick Bourne. I think those show real toughness. And then there was also some pocket movement there on Mac Jones's end, which was impressive at times. Sports Info Solutions, they track quarterback attempts based on their footwork at the time of a throw. And he was tied for the league lead, Mac Jones was, for throws on the move, believe it or not. And this wasn't a big rollout, throw outside the pocket kind of game for Mac Jones. But he had 16 attempts that were tracked as either moving or quote unquote shuffling. And 13 of those 16 came from within the pocket. So what's that tell you? He senses pressure again, pressure on a third of his dropbacks. He senses it. He's finding space. He's trying to extend the play when he's working with two rookie guards in front of him. And he's trying to put his team in the best position possible without racking up a huge total when it comes to passes thrown away, just chucked out of bounds. Because as soon as you feel pressure or as soon as you sniff anything going wrong with the protection up front, you bail. That's not what he did. And again, 58 dropbacks. So he's going to have more opportunities for attempts on the move, attempts on the move within the pocket than a lot of other quarterbacks. But I thought that that number was indicative of what we saw on Sunday and what we heard on Wednesday. We're recording this on Wednesday afternoon. We just had the opportunity to talk to both Mac Jones and David Andrews about toughness at the quarterback position, moving in the pocket at that position, how important it is. And so let's throw to some of that sound right now. Let's first go to David Andrews on Mac Jones's pocket presence and how it helped out the Patriots offensive line. I think Mac, you know, did a lot of really good things in the pocket last week for us, right? Moving in the pocket, understanding the pocket where his problems are, what he needs to do. Uh, you know, offensive football is a team sport to the most degree, right? Like the receivers got to run the right routes, so therefore the ball can come out, and then the offensive line always has to do our job. Um, you know, Mac did a great job for us this week, really understanding some of the issues. I thought he showed, you know, talk about toughness as an O line and running backs, right? But I think as a quarterback to stand in there and take some shots and deliver the balls, I think that shows. That's how a quarterback shows his toughness. And I think he did a really good job for us. And you, you know, sometimes don't notice it during the game, right? Because it's the game and you're not seeing everything. And then you get home and watch the film and, you know, watch him standing in there knowing he's going to take a shot, delivering a ball. You know, I think that's, that shows a lot of maturity and, and toughness from him. And, um, you know, we got to do a better job of keeping him upright and not letting him take some of those shots. But I um, thought he did a really good job for us on Sunday. So there's Andrew's interesting answer for Mac Jones about how important it is for him to show toughness to his teammates. 
limited sometimes in your opportunities to be able to do that compared to, as Andrew's mentioned, offensive linemen, running backs, those positions that we typically associate with that one characteristic. But listen to Mac Jones explain how you have to be smart with when you try to show your toughness as well. There is a line there. I think Bills fans would agree. You watch Josh Allen try to hurdle guys for no reason on Monday Night Football in Jersey, and you're saying, okay, uh, you might want to dial back how often you're trying to show your toughness there, Josh. He's a great quarterback. He's a special quarterback. He's truly elite, in my opinion, one of the three best in the NFL. But you do have to be smart about it. I thought that answer was interesting. Here's Mac Jones. Yeah, I take um, a lot of pride in that. Um, but just standing in there, taking shots if I have to, just continuing to grow in that matter. Um, always felt like as a quarterback, you have to show that in your own way. Some guys do it differently than others, but you also have to be smart. Um, this is a league full of <laughs> a lot of really good players, and they're coming to knock your head off. So you've got to make sure you show that passion and show it in, in unique ways. Um, for me, it's standing in the pocket and ripping it. All right, this is the next Pats podcast. How does this impact the Patriots down the line in the future. Let's talk about the immediate future right now in week two and the challenge that the Patriots will face going up against Vic Fangio and this Dolphins defense. Number one, really talented front. Christian Wilkins, Bradley Chubb, Jalen Phillips, one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best young pass rushers in football really started to come on last year. I think you'll see his game get even more refined in 2023. He'll be even more productive, in my opinion, this year. But What do Mac Jones and his pass catchers have to do to make sure they're keeping him out of those situations where he's facing pressure and where he has to determine, okay, right time to take a shot or not is the best decision to throw it away here? Or am I stepping into this with Bradley Chubb breathing down my neck as I'm about to try to make a throw that's going to change the game? Vic Fangio, again, sort of the godfather of these shell coverages that we're seeing all across the NFL now, the Eagles. And their defensive scheme is the brainchild of Vic Fangio in some ways. You show two high safeties, oftentimes you're rotating, but sometimes it's hard to tell which safety is coming down, which safety is staying back. Are both safeties staying back? Is this cover two? Is it cover three? Is it cover four? Is it quarter, quarter, half? Cover six? What am I looking at? What's the picture pre-snap and what's the picture post-snap? Let's hear from Mac Jones on the challenge of looking at one of these Fangio defenses, the Fangio defense, when the rest of the league is trying to copy the Sage defensive coordinator. They do a good job of that just based on the early film. And um, for me, it's just playing fast, getting the ball out to the person that's supposed to go to and letting those guys play free, regardless of who we're going against, just trying to you know, distribute the ball. If I'm supposed to hand it off, hand it off. If I'm throwing quick, throw quick really well. And if there's a shot, take the shot. So it kind of falls into those buckets, but um, they do a good job with disguise. And a lot of teams will do that against us. And um, from there, you just have to play fast. Interesting to hear from Hunter Henry on this front as well. I had the opportunity to ask him just how important it is, especially at his position, to be reading those safeties. We know safeties in the tight ends, that's often the matchup that we're looking at week to week, but he has to be able to tell in real time, pre-snap, it looks like this, post-snap, what is it truly? And what is my quarterback seeing? Maybe even more importantly, because as long as we're thinking on the same page, we could actually both be wrong. You hear the Patriots talk about this defensively at times, but I think the same is true offensively. If, for instance, you're going against one of these Fangio defenses, you have a play-action pass called, it looks like too high, right at the snap, It's the last thing Mac Jones sees. It's what the tight end sees. He's turning his back to the defense. Jones is all of a sudden to execute a play action fake. He whips his head back around and you know the ball has to be out quickly because of a pressure look that the Dolphins have shown. But maybe the safety picture changes and maybe Mac Jones doesn't have time to see it that way. Does Mac, does Hunter Henry, excuse me, does he go with what he initially saw? Does he try to project? and get in the mind of his quarterback and say, well, he's thinking it's this, so I better do this when it comes to my route. Those little nuances and being on the same page, being on the same wavelength in that way is really, really critical. And I think the Patriots are well-suited to deal with it this early in the season because I think their own defense showed them the same types of coverages and the same types of morphing coverages all throughout camp. Here's Hunter Henry. Uh, it's, it's huge. I mean, that's why we we try to dissect a lot of film together and watch things and communicate well, especially in the 
in the meeting room so that when we go out there, we're on the same page. And then also repping that on the field too, timing, getting a feel for how we different guys run different routes. I mean, we all are different in our own way. So it's that's huge, just going on the field and seeing how guys feel things, see things, and, and run. Did you guys get a lot of work on that going against your own defense? Yeah, yeah, we've we've gotten a lot of work. All, honestly, dating all the way back to when we got here first in the spring, we've gotten a lot, a lot of reps. So, and we got to continue that through the season. Get ready for NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet five dollars and get two hundred in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet five dollars will get one hundred dollars off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use and you can be on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash NBCSB and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hope is here. Gambling helpline MA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support Massachusetts. Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369 New York. 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, or Virginia. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit www.mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Or visit www.1800gambler.net in West Virginia. All right. All right. I get it. Enough about the offense. The Patriots defense played tremendously well. This is the next Pats podcast. When are you going to get to all those young guys that contributed on defense, Perry? All right, well, let's do it right now. Let's bring in Rob Ninkovich right now and learn more about Keon White and that performance that he put together in week one. First game as a pro. And my goodness, did he open some eyes. There he is. The doctor, the good doctor, as I call him, Rob Nikovich. Rob, thanks for being with us, man. Phil, thank you so much. Happy to be here. Let's dive into this thing. Let's do it. Big week this week. This could potentially be, ooh, division, maybe for the division. Now that you have the Jets having some quarterback issues, there's the Buffalo Bills have, you know, uh, offense looks not great with Josh Allen throwing interceptions. So, the Miami Dolphins could potentially be a huge game at the end of the season from week two. So I think this is a massive game with massive ramifications for both teams. And it's I, a Sunday night game. Super I agree. cool. I agree. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully there's a lot of points. The Dolphins tend to score mm. a lot of points. The Patriots tend to not give up that many points. The Patriots, interestingly enough, allow just 13 offensive points to the Dolphins offense, it was week one, new scheme, new coach, new weapons. So maybe they were sort of getting their feet under them, but 13 points on the road last year at Patriots defense, not a bad job by them. I do want to show you great transition by you before we get into Keon White, because we've already teased Keon White for the listeners. They want to see Keon White. If they're watching on YouTube, they want to hear about Keon White. If they're listening to us, I want to show you one Dolphins play Okay, because there's emotion here. And I know you love this stuff. You love the X's and O's of it. Yes. There's, a, there's a coach. There's a coach inside you. I know there is. It's a coach, but I like to sleep and I love my children. <laughs> so it'd be really tough for me to coach in the NFL, but show me the play. Here's I the play. Love- so okay. this is what I have heard referred to as an out motion. You may have another word for it. I'm going to share my screen here. And Adam's going to help us out with the people on the YouTube. Our producer, Adam JC, stepping in for the skull crusher today. So okay. I'm sharing my screen. You're I'm seeing, looking at Tyreek. Tyreek is are, looking in, and he's very deep. So what's that mean? He's going either across the ball, or he's going to go across and then come back out because he's really fast and out leverages the linebacker. So let's see what happens. So that that's what I would have expected too, but watch what he does here. He's going out. Okay. It's just like a wheel route. That's all it is. It's like a wheel route. So that's it's how you would handle it. It's basically a flat wheel with 
so with Tyree Kill, he's so fast. They're trying to catch, you know, your defense in a position to where imagine if he runs a wheel, right? And that nasty split. See that nasty split right he's there tight. with that number one? That, that tight he's... split is I call it nasty. Right. With that split of the receiver right there, if you run like a rub or like a pick route to where that guy that is on Tyreek gets just bumped a second, he's gone, you know, like on a wheel route. So imagine right. if Tyreek was in the backfield, okay? Right. Like just put him from that point and just put him in as a running back and he runs a flat wheel. It's basically the same exact thing as what he's doing right here, okay? So – See right there, he goes with him. That is to try and create space for either a two-way go, which would be Tyreek is one-on-one in uh, an open space with a defensive back. He can That's either, J.C. Jackson, believe it or not. Yes, who I think didn't finish that game, correct? It was a, it was a rough game for him. I don't know if he finished it or not, but he had a tough yeah. time. I think, I think he might not have. but Because what happens here is with Tyreek being so, like, James White, for example, they used a lot of this same situation as far as the defender trying to cover out of the backfield with a guy that is super quick on a two-way go. So James could get you square, because what they want to do is get you square to the line of scrimmage and then inside or outside. This time, he's just going up, and then he's going to push up like a wheel route and then see how right now if that if JC Jackson did an in cut like if because his hips return nobody's stopping that is that who they're throwing the ball to right now yeah they throw it to him yeah Bang. yeah that's you his hips so what his hips do is you can see early on in the play see right now they're turned now he flips now see his hips right now are pointed towards the sideline right there's no way that he's going to be able to stop an inside route right. And then watch how Tyreek climbs on him, gets tight to him, turns him around basically like Barry Sanders does, and now there's no possible way for him to keep up with him. So in that situation, from the start, go back, let's see from the start. I would anticipate if you have any type of number 10 close to, to a linebacker, or close to anyone in the line of scrimmage, Try to get your hands on them at any point to just slow mm. them down a little bit, just a little bit. Because what you want to do is just screw up how he wants to release. And this is a great play offensively to use his speed against the defense. Um, but then you also probably want to mix in some zone with some man. You don't want to be just man coverage on the Dolphins because they're going to run all their man beaters, right? So would you play some zone? Like, would you, for instance, in this rep that the Chargers are clearly playing man, but if he's tight, if he's nasty, if he has that nasty split like that, are you saying, hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to use this corner and 100%. when he gets off the line, I try to get my hands on him and then we're playing zone from there or something. You could, you could definitely do that, but you wouldn't want to stay in zone and, and be like a zone defense. You'd want to change it up based on, you know, you could go two by two, you're in two, and then three by one, you go three. Um, cover two and cover see. three is it just for yeah. the listeners, yeah. Yeah, cover – so two by two, basically when there's two receivers on each side, you want to be in like a cover two look because really the weak spots in cover two are your seams straight down the middle of the field, right? Right. Your kind of strong points are your corners are – basically on your flat routes and they're they're able to kind of quarterback zone read and see what's going on three when you're in cover three you know those overs and a corner route is what that weak spots are so you know you're you're kind of trying to you're trying to catch the miami dolphins in let's not show we're in man it'll try to hold our water but I know they do a lot of, of emotion, which when when a team is moving around a lot, what they're trying to do is see, are we in man, are we in zone? So you can disguise that. You can have some guys move, sometimes stay, but you can play it. It'll be interesting to see how they cover um, 
10 because of how quick and how explosive he is. So I would anticipate any time you could get your hands on him just to affect him a little bit, they're going to try to slow him down if he's close to the line, line of scrimmage. Um, I would also anticipate that if there's any type of a cross, you know, types motion where Tyreek goes the opposite side, you're going to have to ask maybe your ends to do some peeling. So not necessarily to cover him, you know, down the field, but as he gets out wide, try and redirect him, try and get your hands on him and then run with him to the flat. Hopefully that gives you some time. Um, we used to do a lot of that with, you know, a lot of quick Reggie Bush when he was with Miami, um, Shady McCoy when he was with Buffalo. Like you're not you're not just letting those guys release to the flat or just get into their route with nothing in their way because he, they build speed and they're so fast. You know, you always have to account for Tyreek. And, you know, I can guarantee this this week, Bill is pounding the podium saying number 10, number 10, number 10. You know, we have to make sure we know where he's at at all times. When he goes off um, for 200 yards the week before, you would yeah. think. And, and I think another thing that's going to be super important is, you know, the front's going to have to get some pressure on Tua. And the Patriots seem to have a great, you know, formula right now for a balance between having a, a rush front that's fresh, you know, good rotation, and, you know, that's going to be a key for definitely when they're playing Sunday night. Okay, great transition, because I want to ask you about this rookie, Keon White, and I specifically wanted to ask you about him, not just because he plays on the edge, you played on the edge, and not just mm -hmm. because you've got a big brain. I wish I was 6'5", five, five, 285, 290, <laughs> whatever he is. So he is he's pretty special physically, but when we had our conversation pre-draft, about what the Patriots like on the edge and you have to be smart and you have to be versatile and you have to be tough. And the, you laid out everything that, that they're looking for. Ideally knowing that most guys don't have all of this. I went back and I looked and from what I'd heard from people that are studying the college prospects and some of the stuff that I had read and um, you know, specifically Dane Brugler for the athletic does a great job as these massive, massive write-ups on these guys. And I went back and I looked and I said, this guy Keon White really matches that description that we got from Rob Ninkovich. And wouldn't you know, they end up drafting him in the second round. So he has been part of this pass rush plan all summer. Um, it didn't surprise me that he played um, as much as he did. I think he played 23 total snaps. He had 13 pass rush snaps, Rob. He had four pressures against a pretty good offensive line. That's a pretty good percentage. I don't think yep. that's necessarily sustainable, but I did want to just lay some of the stuff out here for you and we'll watch a few plays. You can tell us what you like, maybe what you don't like. I'll ask you for a three word scouting report after the fact, but here's one play um, where he is lined up over the left tackle, Jordan Mailata, who's about six, nine, 400 pounds and uses yeah, some, good. some pretty good power there. It looks like. Yeah. That's, we'll get a better angle really of it here. Really good um, stutter bull. So, you know, he's coming out of a two-point stance. Um, avoids a little bit of the chip there. Great hand placement. So he kind of he puts my lot on skates there because of just the leverage that he's using um, with a really strong low to high bull rush. And the, the, the best thing about this that, you know, from my perspective, when you get into this power rush sometimes – when you're right here, sometimes it's really hard to get off of that because your hips aren't are kind of, you know, closed and you're not able to open up. The best thing about this particular rush is when Hertz gets out, right? If you hit play, when he gets out right there, he goes flat down the line of scrimmage, right? So that is, you know, almost veteran-esque because he understands I got a fast quarterback that just got out on me. I'm not going to catch him if I try to get up the field. I have to literally put my foot in the ground and go flat. Um, Good to hustle the there too. Line. Do you like the Do you like the motor? Yep, yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, hey, it's like a shark, man. It's like Jaws. You know, when you chum it up and you got blood in the water, when you bull rush a guy like that and you're in the quarterback's lap, you you can sense it. You're right there, so it gives you that extra motivation. You want to um, get to the quarterback. So I love that bull rush. Um, great hands, good awareness there, and, and good angle on the pursuit.
he's a little different placement here. And this is one of the reasons why I think the Patriots like him. And again, he's, he's versatile. So you, you mentioned he's in a two point stance on that last rep. He's uh, in a little different technique here and on the opposite side of the line. So he's, he's over right tackle now, Lane Johnson. We'll get a better angle of it here, but you can tell us what technique this is, how the responsibilities maybe change when you're aligned in that way. But again, pretty good hustle here. You can see from the overhead view. Yeah, so in this particular play, as the it basically he's a five technique. You know, he could be a, you could call that a five eye or whatever because he's eye to eye on the tackle. Um, and then his responsibility is contain, but especially with Uche on the right side, um, it's basically a it's it's basically a thirty four look here mm-hmm. um, because you have your three down, you got your head up nose. And you have this pass rush here where he's got to get contain on the quarterback. It's a Roy rush. So Uche's coming on the rush. Um, what that means is the left end has contain on the quarterback to the left side, which, you know, the left side's the more important side when it comes to protecting the, the B gap step up in the majority of quarterbacks when they have space, they want to go up and to their right because it's a lot easier to throw when you're scrambling to your right versus when you're a right-handed quarterback and you scramble to your left, you have to actually turn your shoulders around to throw the football. Um, So in this particular play, the slide, you know, the slide is basically the guard and center on the nose. Um, you got a fan there by um, Johnson out, and then you have your one on one with the tackle on Uche, and then you got your one on one. Is that Kelsey out? I can't tell if that's the center or. I think the center's uh-huh. on. Um, yeah, on so the center's right here. there. Okay, so so right now it's basically up to those three guys with the one on ones to try and get to the quarterback or not let them step up. So. In all honesty, you know, Hertz missed an opportunity to step up because if he steps up right there, 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 I mean, there's no shot of anyone really getting there considering they're all walled off. So on this particular play, they kind of got lucky because if he would have stepped up, I think that he would have been able to at least get out of the pocket. So is that a little is 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 white and he's a young guy? It's his first game. Is he a little? I don't want to say loose, but is he a little over aggressive with this rush? Would you say? Well, some, I mean, look, you, you have to take a little bit of risk to, to have a, a reward here. So I love the hustle. I love him chasing him down. Um, but the way that that rush is sometimes that's not an ideal position to rush from, you know, a five technique, basically mm-hmm. a four eye. That's not, that's not a pass rusher's dream. Let's just put it that way. Um, so in reality, could he have been a little bit better on, on keeping the quarterback, uh, the, that ability for the quarterback to step up better? Sure. But in that instance, like he's trying to get around a really good tackle and, you know, do his best against the guy who's a really good, you know, pass protector. Might, might be going to the Hall of Fame. Exactly. Here, here's, another, here's another one where he's, he's working on Lane Johnson again, but he's back in that two-point stance. He's out a little wider. And on this play, you'll see he actually gets – it looks like he gets his hand on Hurts and helps force a throw away. Yeah, a- so that's a that's a great rush. Um, and I'm just looking at basically his line. So right now, you know, what you want to do from that position, where he's at, the quickest, uh, the quickest way to get to the quarterback is a straight line. So A to B, straight line he does a great job of using his power and weight um, to just go basically straight, you know? So if you watch him, he's going, see that position, he's going straight to the quarterback and he's not rounding it. He's not running away from Lane Johnson. He's literally just putting his feet in the ground and using that strength with great inside hand. So like right now, if you click where his hand is, that's in the inside armpit. That is like the ideal place to get, you know, good pressure, good push. Um, on a tackle that's like the money spot right there so with this position he's able to continue to just put the tackle on skates and go right back to the quarterback that's a great rush 
I mean, that that is an ideal picture of what you want to see your left side of, of the pass rush to look like. You know, no space in between the B gaps there, straight A to B rush, no, you know, running away from the tackle, no avoiding of the tackle, just get after him, push him back to the quarterback and get in his lap. That's a great rush. And so that technique would be, so you've, you've seen him at, at the five technique right over the tackle, uh, like in a 34 sort of look. He looked more like an outside linebacker there at 290 pounds or whatever he is. Yeah, How he rare has, is that? Yeah, like if I was that size um, and had everything that I had as a player, um, potentially it would be my 18th season right now uh, if that was the case. <laughs> and I 100% maybe potentially would have been in the Hall of Fame. But that didn't happen, <laughs> and that wasn't in the cards for me. So, um, so he's, he's pretty got, special is what you're saying physically. Yeah, oh, yeah. If you can, you know, play in a four technique in a two point stance rush and, you know, put a tackle on the quarterback's lap with hustle and, you know, keeping energy up. I think the biggest thing for him moving forward would be Bill likes to give you a little bit and then give you another scoop, give you a little bit more, see if you can handle it. So it would be, you know, if his 20 something reps goes to potentially 40 reps, you know, does, does there any drop in, you know, hustle or is there any drop in that quickness or spring coming off the edge? Um, and then also at that weight, you know, he's a great size for stopping the run. So, you know, great inside move. Uh, that's not ideal what you want on that side of the line of scrimmage, but, you know. So that's what I wanted to ask you about this one. If people are watching on YouTube, he's, he's, he's over Lane Johnson again, but this is the one where, I said to myself, I wonder what Rob would say about this one because he's he's jumping inside for people who aren't watching on you. Not everybody that listens to this is is watching the pictures as well. So he's he's really working hard inside, and what happens is Hertz ends up escaping to the to the edge that he sort of vacates. So I was curious is this is this a no no for Bill Belichick? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a play that Bill would say. I mean, we can't have this. Like, if you're going to make that inside move. You have to try and make that play. You have to get vertical because um, the, the problem with that specific play, especially with a mobile quarterback. Now, I mean, you see the split there. It's a good split between the guard and tackle. The tight end obviously is releasing. Um, so when he does make this inside move, let's see it. So right there, that. That, that move right there, which he does an arm over. Okay. It, the only thing which that I personally didn't love doing was an arm over on an inside move because you can get washed a little bit too far. Um, basically, what the tackle is going to try and do here is just ride you in just like that. So basically, uh, what Lane Johnson did is just move him over a couple body lengths and Hurts being the good quarterback that he is is going to feel that and get out. And that just puts a ton of pressure on the secondary. I mean, it's a great job by the linebacker there filling. So, you know, if that if they were spying right there, that inside backer, so sometimes they might do a mirror or a, a type of, you know, mirror with the inside linebacker to where when the pocket breaks, so when the quarterback breaks, you break, and your job is to basically go and pull them up. That's a really good job there by the inside linebacker. That's um, Jelani Tavai there, who is playing right in the middle of the field. And as soon as Hertz left the pocket, he was he was yep. beelining yep. it toward him. Yep. So that that could have possibly been a mirror call right there to where they're mirroring the quarterback. And it's basically a spy mirror. So the, the inside linebacker goes back, you know, body presence to any crossing routes, reading the quarterback really hard. If the quarterback gets out left or right, you just go and add in right away. Um, so I, I personally don't have an issue with an inside move, but sometimes they can hurt you. So if you're playing against a team that has a mobile quarterback and you make that inside move and they do get out, you might sometimes you have to you pay a price for that. Right now, in that particular play, that was a great, you know, great inside linebacker play, just trying to stop the quarterback from scrambling. But, you know, I don't think they'll have to worry about Tua does not want to run. You know, two is not a guy that's looking to run. He's looking to throw the football down the field. Um, and, you know, the one thing I would say is you're, you're playing a quarterback that missed a lot of time last year because he got hit. So, you know, what you got to try and do 
is you're not trying to hurt anybody, but you're just trying to get to the quarterback. You're trying to make sure that they feel your presence. And I, and I really think that the Patriots defense um, this year will keep them in division contention and playoff contention. And I think they're just having spoken to a few people in the organization since that game on Sunday, it seems like they're pretty excited about their front. And, and it gets back to what you said off the top, which is they've got a nice, they've got the ability to have a nice little rotation here and have guys with fresh legs. You know, you can take Dietrich Wise, who's been a really productive pass rusher for them the last couple of years. You can take him out and put Keon White in. You can get Barmore in there. You can use Uche, Judon, obviously. So they've they've got they've got a number of guys uh, to throw at opposing offensive lines, which should be able to help them out. Okay, I need the three word scouting report from what you've watched. Realize when we've watched four plays with Keon White here closely. <laughs> what is the three word scouting report for Keon White from Rob Nikovich? I would say tons of talent. I like how you went with an actual sentence there. I thought you were going to say maybe, you know, length, power, whatever. No, tons Speed. of, tons of tons talent. Of ta okay. He's very talented. That's a ton of talent. When I'm watching just from those clips, and I didn't watch the tape like that, like just from those clips, I would say, dang, that kid's got a ton of talent. And you could just tell by his ability to play in a two point on either side, you know, left and right. Some guys don't. They're not comfortable rushing from the left side or the right side. I mean, he basically was able to move, you know, two big men into the quarterback's lap from both sides, hustle, you know, speed to the football, 6'5", 290. That, that's tons of talent right there. So now I think the job for the Patriots is to develop the talent to being an elite level and – He's a, as, as a young guy, he's got the ability to be very elite. I think, I mean, he could be a super elite player now being smart in certain situations. Um, I think that that comes into a lot of what the Patriots like defensively, situational awareness, um, understanding situations, using guys to their ability in certain instances that maximize what the defense is trying to do. Um, so that being said, I mean, I love Wise, but I think that just looking at a couple of those, I mean, you could, I could see him being a, a little bit more included in the third down rush um, and Wise being more included in, in possibly early down stuff. Um, they are deep at the position up front, and they have guys that can move around. So I'm sure Bill is licking his chops and – Mayo and Steve are, are having a blast, you know, coming up with different game plans. He's he's somebody that they actually considered. My understanding is they considered taking him in the first round with that with that pick that they had before trading down and ending up with Christian Gonzalez. They looked at it and said, well, we actually like a few of these guys. And one of them was Keon White. They end up getting him in the second. I'm sure they saw what you saw, which is, man, look at all that talent. 290. Six five. He's running, you know, some of his college tape. You can see him running with running backs on wheel routes down the sideline. It's pretty impressive. So it's you're right. It's just a question of molding it. Maybe they do. They they start using him situationally. It looked like really in week one, it was almost like series by series. Like Wise would be out there for a series, then White, and then Wise maybe would get two series, then White would get one. So maybe yeah. they start tinkering with that a little bit more. As we go, I think it's along. all situational based on personnel too. So depending on who they're playing, mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at the schedule. They're not; they have a very tough schedule. They're going to play some very talented, you know, quarterbacks. This week coming up, they have more of that dynamic offense. You know, get the ball out quick, catch and run, um, 10, 10, 10, Make sure you get ten. Um, so I think pressure on the quarterback is going to be key. And I think the biggest thing with this team is going to be starting fast. You know, you, you see last week they didn't start fast. They, you know, you go down 16 points. I don't care who you are. It's going to be tough to come back from. And, you know, guess what? If they didn't have those turnovers, they didn't have a pick six, they would have won the game. Um, so those just little lessons that I think this team will probably learn as the season goes and, I guarantee Bill's emphasizing all those different things and explaining it the way that Bill does uh, to where this team isn't where they're going to be in a month. 
So saw a lot of promising things. Now it just comes down to execution and starting fast, getting out the blocks fast and scoring in the red zone. Last year, that was their biggest issue was touchdowns in the red zone. If they can score points in the red zone, their defense can play tight football. I think that they have a chance to compete with every single team they play. That's for sure. Rob Nikovich, you're the best. I appreciate you. You're all over this great region. You did your own podcast. Hey, check out the 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 Dan and Dan Nico and pod. Dan and Dan Nico and pod. Nico, you guys yeah. are doing your thing we, there. We just have fun. You know, it's like uh, Dan O'Brien, you know, keeping it awesome. Dan O'Brien Kia. He's got the cartoons out there. You know, I just I, we met a long time ago and, you know, just started doing something for fun, not not being too serious about it. And it's turned into just that that a fun thing. You know, we might have an IPA and talk about a local brewery on the show. Um, you know, we have some guests from time to time. We had Gronk. I literally just recovered from uh, trying to throw the ball farther than Gronk. And I actually said I could throw the football farther than Mac Jones. And um, I did not. I did not throw the ball. I said I could throw it 62. How, how far did you get it? I got 58. That's still so pretty good. pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty good. I think I could get it to 62 if I didn't have like a, a – we had a kind of a stiff wind left to right. Um, and how much are you training for this? I mean, how often are you throwing it that far? Up. I just started throwing the football as far as I could. Was which, it just click, 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 click as the arm came through? I've always had a really good arm, so like it just was very sore after mm. trying that about 10 times. And then Gronk walked up and goes, I never even tried this before. And threw the ball like 65 yards. So it was insane. Because he's, he's kind a of a specimen. He's, he is a specimen. Yes, he is. Talk about a ton of talent. That guy had a ton of talent. Still does, apparently. The guy could still easily play. It's, it's well, wild. Well, thank you. Seriously, I know you, you were all over the joint today. You're coaching football. I mean, you're a madman. So thank you. This is great. Trying. Love learning the game from my guy. So appreciate you. Salute, my friend, Phil. Have a great one. Be good. Thank you, guys. Take care. Great stuff there from Rob. Always great to learn a little bit more about the game from him, specifically on the defensive side, specifically with what's going on up front and on the edge. Nobody better to talk to when it comes to what the Patriots are looking for on that edge specifically, and then how they may use a certain player given his physical skill set and what he's shown on tape. Small sample from Keon White, but again, I'm expecting that sample to grow and grow and grow as the season goes on. Let's grade some of the rookie performances, shall we? I'm giving Keon White an A-. I, I, I am. I know it wasn't perfect, but four pressures and 13 pass rushing snaps is absolutely tremendous, especially against a very talented offensive line. You got to leave some room for growth there because I can't give him an A right off the bat. You know, no sacks. What if he comes up with a sack and a forced fumble in week two? You know, we got we to gotta leave a little bit of breathing room there. But again, from the amount he played, giving him the A minus in week one. I'm also giving Christian Gonzalez an A minus. I know I said that I thought White was actually the most impressive Patriots rookie, and I still believe that. But I guess if we're doing number grades, you know, Keon White would be, you know, maybe a 93, and Christian Gonzalez would be a 90 to play every single snap in your first game as a pro and to go up against AJ Brown and for him to finish the game with fewer than 80 yards receiving to get your hands on the football almost ends up with a pick on fourth down it's a turnover on downs doesn't matter one way or the other but a beautiful play to undercut a crossing route very similar to what stefan gilmore did on a rainy day against the cowboys at gillette stadium a few years back undercutting amari cooper and picking it off that's pretty special physical ability to understand what the route is understand that the ball's coming out understand where your help is when to take a little bit of a risk and still get your hands on the football. Great, great play from Christian Gonzalez. Oh, also really liked the play deep down the field. It was a post corner for A.J. Brown. Really tight coverage with, again, one of the best and most physically gifted receivers in all of football. Tremendous work from Christian Gonzalez. And lastly, the physicality. We talked on this podcast, on our television programs, on the Patriots Talk podcast. This is not my opinion. This is opinions of folks within the league who studied Christian Gonzalez, who met with Christian Gonzalez, who worked out Christian Gonzalez, whose teams thought about drafting Christian Gonzalez. The primary concern with this particular player 
was his willingness to bring the level of physicality necessary to play defense at the NFL level, even at corner where physicality isn't necessarily the number one trait. There were concerns on that front. There were no concerns on that front when it came to Sunday night, in my opinion. One-on-one tackles on A.J. Brown. You know, I, I thought a key tackle on third down uh, at one point late in that football game. All kinds of throwing his body around. And again, playing 100% of the snaps against a really physical team with really physical, one in particular, really physical receiver. High marks across the board for Christian Gonzalez. I'm going B plus for Marte Mapu. 10 snaps, but he's all over the field. And again, he's playing post safety. And he's running with A.J. Brown down the middle of the field on that post corner, not fooled in the right place at the right time. He's playing linebacker. He's playing outside linebacker. He's everywhere. He's on the field early in this game. I thought it was instructive to listen to Matthew Judon after the game to hear just how impressed he was by Mapu's versatility, even though he had a relatively limited role. Let's hear from Matthew Judon. It's a welcome to the NFL, man. Uh, We... We knew when we drafted them and we got them in here and they actually put pads on that they were, they were really good players. And when Marte was in the game, uh, him making plays and just kind of being all over the field. Uh, I don't really know Marte background too much. I watch highlights and uh, things like that. But him for him to be able to play linebacker safety and outside linebacker, uh, that's, just, that's just kind of un- unbelievable and as a rookie. Okay, so maybe more coming from Marte Mapu as the season wears on. You would think somebody with that kind of versatility, as the injuries start to pile up across the Patriots defense, maybe he does start to see action more at one position than another. But for him to be on the field and early, and as often as somebody like Jalen Mills, who's only on the field for nine defensive snaps, a little bit of a head scratcher, uh, but they like what they have, and their, their top two safeties are clearly Jabril Peppers and Kyle Duggar after week one of the season. I think if you see a linebacker go down, if you see a safety go down, all of a sudden Marte Mapu's workload shoots up. Let's go to the offensive side and look at some of the rookies there. City So and Antonio Mafi. I'm giving both players C's. Okay. A gentleman's C. I think in all honesty, if these were veteran guys, if they were expected to be immediate contributors in a way that a day one pick would be, as opposed to the day three picks that they are. This grade would probably be even a little bit lower. They just couldn't do much in the run game. Um, 12 pressures allowed between the two of them. But I thought, given the situation that they were thrust into, relatively impressive. And so that's where I sort of fall, right in the middle. I give both players a C. We'll see if they continue to have to start with Cole Strange and Michael Wen, who's still dealing with their injuries. Kayshawn Booty's getting a C as well. Doesn't have a single catch. So the grade could be lower here, but again, he shouldn't have to be on the field for more than 50% of the snaps. He shouldn't be on the field more often than Juju Smith-Schuster. And to me, this is a injury thing. It's a team building thing in some ways. The fact that he was thrust into that situation as a sixth round pick, who again, had an impressive summer. We, we tracked it here on next Pats. And he had an amazing start to his LSU career. So there is clearly ability there. But is he ready to be playing more than half the snaps and be targeted late in this game with a game-changing potential catch coming off of his fingertips and being snared and being hauled in but not getting both feet down? Is he supposed to be in that spot? Is that supposed to be him out there? No. It's supposed to be Devontae Parker. Or maybe if Parker's on the field, maybe that moves uh, Excuse me, Kendrick Bourne to a different position. Maybe it's Kendrick Bourne who's making that catch along the sideline. But between Parker's inability to remain available and we'll see if he's available for week two and Juju Smith-Schuster's inability to be available at the end of that game the other night well now you're putting a day three rookie in a really difficult spot so again he gets the C we're not going to go lower than that even though he's 0 for 4 on targets and even though he had opportunities at big plays on two separate occasions but can't get both feet and bounds the Juju Smith-Schuster conversation is a fascinating one and maybe that'll evolve as we get through the week this week. But I asked Bill Belichick today if he was healthy enough to finish the game because he said earlier in the week that his conditioning was fine. And I'm still trying to figure out 
why Juju Smith-Schuster wasn't used late in that game because the fact that he's not part of the two-minute package, I, I, I'm just not buying. This guy is one of your highest paid players. He is your big name free agent acquisition. And in the two-minute drill, a receiver, heavy period, for him not to be on the field just because that's the package that you chose, that's a problem if Kayshawn Booty has already shown so much and Juju Smith-Schuster has shown little enough for the rookie sixth rounder to be beating him out, all things being equal. There's something else afoot there. I don't necessarily believe, I know on the radio, they talked about him running the wrong route on fourth and three. He didn't run the wrong route. His release wasn't good. But I asked Ross Douglas, receivers coach, if he ran the wrong route on that play, he said no. And I think we can read Ross pretty well, high energy guy. He is as honest as he can be with us in my experience that I've had with him. He didn't run the wrong route. I think he would tell us if he did. Or he, he would make it known that there was a problem with the type of route that he ran. It wasn't the wrong route, but how he ran it, where he lost leverage immediately off the bat. I think he was really supposed to sell something inside, maybe get the defender to, to overplay in that direction and then bend it out. He just didn't sell it at all. And maybe that's because there's not much juice in his legs. And that's maybe because he's still dealing with a knee that's not 100%. There's, a, there's an issue there with Juju Smith-Schuster. He should have been on the field late in that game, and he wasn't something to keep an eye on. Pop Douglas gets a B from me. I thought a really good night when Mac Jones had time and when he had a clean pocket, you know, Pop Douglas is creating separation. And he's reeling in catches for, you know, four for 40. That's a nice day for the rookie sixth rounder. He's got, he has juice. You want to talk about juice? That, that's something that he brings to the table. Is there still some work to be done in terms of refining the routes? You know, again, Ross Douglas, he comes up again on the next pass. We should just have him on the podcast and just have him as a guest. Why not? But he explained it, I thought, in great detail on the play where he had to break up a potential interception. While that was a nice play, receiver becomes a defensive back. You make sure it's not a turnover. Great job. The fact that that defensive back had an opportunity to make a play on the football in the first place might have been, according to Douglas, because he didn't really finish his route the way he was supposed to. A little bit rounded, a little loose at the top of the route is how Douglas described it. That allows the defense to maybe make a play. So good recovery, but stuff to be cleaned up when it comes to his route running. He gets a B. Bryce Berenger gets a B minus. Touchback on one punt. Or it would have been really nice for them to be able to pin the Eagles uh, deep in their own territory. He outkicked his coverage on another absolutely booming shot. You know, 65, might have been 65 plus on the distance, but the kick was then returned for 25 yards. And the Eagles had it at about their own 30 to start a drive. That's not what you're looking for, especially when you have really good gunners in, in Matthew Slater and Brendan Schooler. So He's got a massive, massive leg. We know that. It's just a question of, are you able to sync that up with your punt coverage to really maximize the return that you're getting when it comes to field position? He did put a few inside the 20, though, so he ends up with the B-. minus. Chad Ryland, he gets an incomplete. No field goal at the end. No fault of his own. Uh, but I thought there, were, there was at least one opportunity on that fourth and three with nine and a half minutes left that, you know, bad conditions, late in the game, I thought it would have been a, a nice opportunity to try to build some confidence in your young kicker because that's essentially a chip shot based on where they were on the field. But did that factor into Bill Belichick's decision-making at all? Well, it's the fourth quarter. It's late. It's close. We don't want to put our rookie kicker in that situation in his first game. He had already made a couple of extra points at that point. Good for him on that front. But man, that, that remains, I think, a fair second guess a few days after week one. All in all, great day for the rookies of the New England Patriots. And hopefully, for their sake, they're going to be able to continue that. We have a blast tracking their progress as they go through their rookie year. We'll continue to track second year, third year guys, even Mac Jones. Doesn't matter that he's getting deeper into his career. We're going to continue to follow him, follow him very closely here on Next Pats. Don't you worry. Thanks so much for listening, guys. If you haven't, if you haven't, we don't ask for much. We don't ask for much here on this podcast, but if you could, you have some time, you have a free second. If you could give us a rating, if, if you could leave a comment, if you could subscribe, if you haven't already, for whatever reason, please do so. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the NBC Sports Boston channel as well. We really, truly 
appreciate it. It helps us grow the podcast and help honestly produce a better product for you at the end of the day. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your help on that front. And keep an eye out for the next next Pats. We'll be coming at you next week, talking Patriots Dolphins, looking ahead to week three against an Aaron Rodgers list. Say that three times fast. Jets squad. Should be a lot of fun. We'll talk to you then.